thank you for inviting me again to give a lecture in this uh, cyber size uh, webinars. Today we will talk about anterior segment OCT. So anterior segment OCT, we have like three different technologies applied for anterior segment OCT, much the same that we have for posterior segment OCT. Regular time domain OCT, then we have the second generation, though those are a spectrometer based OCT. And then we have the third generation that's called a uh, swept source OCT. So if we talk just about anterior segment OCT, these are all the anterior segments OCT that you have right now in the, in the market, including some of them that do posterior segment OCT and also anterior segment OCT. If we were talking about the technologies, the first one, uh, time domain OCTs, just like the Visante OCT or this slip lamp OCT uh, from Heidelberg, Heidelberg just launched a new anterior segment OCT this year. But these two actually were time domain OCTs and they work with a wavelength around 13, 10 nanometers. That's the perfect wavelength for the anterior segment. When you're doing OCTs on the posterior segment, usually you work around a wavelength of 80, 40, 80, 20 nanometers. This is because retina tissue on a choroid, if you're gonna go through the retina and go through a choroid, doesn't have that much liquid consistency and, uh, as the cornea or the anterior segment. So when you're doing imaging of the anterior segment, you need a deeper wavelength. The second reason for anterior segment OCTs is better, a uh, bigger wavelength, is because you wanna go through some deep media. For example, if you wanna look at the vertex of the angle, you have to go through a sclera because usually the vertex is beneath the sclera. So if you want to identify clearly this uh, anatomic reference position, then you need an OCT with a bigger wavelength. I don't wanna say that OCTs with shorter wavelengths, like usually OCTs that are done for posterior segment and working with anterior segment too, uh, won't work. You will get great images, but you won't get the resolution as you will get with this. That being said, the third generation of OCTs, swept source OCT also work with 13, 10 nanometer wavelength. The Tritom OCT works with 10, 50 nanometers. It's an error here in the slide, but it's almost the same. So this kind of uh, wavelength divine, defines the quality of the image. Also one important thing to take in account as in posterior segment OCT is the scan speed. If you're talking about time domains OCT, they do 20, uh, I mean, 2,200 uh, A scans per second. If we are talking about swept source OCTs, they could do up to 1,000, 100,000 A scans per second. So that's an important point. Here's again, something to think about, about the principles and the resolution. This is 1310 nanometers. You get an actual, a better action resolution than a 1050. You get a standard resolution and in 840, you won't get that good resolution of the, the other two. Talking again about resolution and comparing OCT with other imaging technologies, if we want to see the resolution of the ultrasound that we usually use for interior segment, resolution is around one millimeter. It's almost the same as a CT scan of or our MRI. If we want to see smaller tissues, then we need another type of, of uh, imaging technology. And here is where came SLO, scanning laser ophthalmoscopes and OCT imaging. We're talking about a hundred micron. If we're going to look at smaller tissue, then we need again, another type of resolution. Uh, resolutions comes on hand with a speed of acquisition. So if you want a better resolution, it will, it will take more time than if you do regular scans with regular resolution. So if we compare anterior segment uh, UVM 
with a 50 megahertz uh, probe versus OCT imaging, you will see that the resolution of the OCT imaging, it's uh, better. Now, penetration of the ultrasound, it's more. Here you can see what's going on beneath the iris and the ciliary body down here. And with regular OCTs, you could not. So here comes our first poll question. Which types of OCT technologies are available for anterior segment OCT? So here comes the results and the results are all of the above. That's right. You have time domain OCTs. Remember, this is the first technology uh, like the Visante OCTs, spectral domain OCTs, 840, 820 nanometers. Most OCTs in the market do anterior and posterior. Swept source OCT give us the best resolution for anterior and posterior segment OCT because it goes deeper because of the wavelength, we talk about it. So the answer is all of the above. Here we got some of the images of things that you could do with anterior segment OCTs. With the technology being evolving and constantly evolving, you could see a lot of uh, different uh, landmarks, anatomic landmarks in the anterior segment. You could see here outer limbus, corneoscleral transition junction, trabecular mesh, uh, Schlem canal, uh, angle recess. You see that the angle here, you couldn't see it quite well when you're doing a regular spectral domain OCT. If you go to a uh, swept source OCT, then you could see better the uh, angle recess and clearly the vertex of the angle. So if you're doing goniometry, when you're doing goniometry, you could measure a lot of different uh, points in the anterior segment, you could uh, measure a a ACD 500, AOD, those are uh, apertures of the angle, then the different types of, of, of distance that are between the angle and the iris, and you could see if this is a, an angle that could be occluded with some sort of, of pathology. You could also see the cement membrane, the Schlem canal again, trabecular measure, endothelium, and uh, of course, the iris. So depending on the different technologies, you could have different angled measurements. All of these are called metrics or goniometry. There are measurements of the anterior segment. These measurements of anterior segments sometimes take in account the vertex of the, uh, of the angle, and sometimes they just need to assume this because the type of technology they're using it couldn't measure all of these different measurements. Different OCTs has different tools to doing all these measurements, but this could also help a lot in seeing different types of, of glaucoma. If we compare anterior segment OCT with uh, another anterior segment technology, such as shine fluke images, you can see that the images look quite the same. Shine fluke images have been used for a long time to reconstruct and do 3D models. And with this 3D models, you could do measurements of different uh, anterior segment structures, but not only like goniometrics or anterior ch chamber depth metrics, they could do elevation maps. So based on this technology, Shine fluke, we've been a long time using it for uh, topographic maps and elevation maps. So when OCT starts evolving and we got better images like this one, uh, the technology also evolves and let us do what we usually do with regular corneal topographs or with uh, shine fluke based uh, technology. We could do measurements of the cornea, of course, not only on the center, but we could measure the whole cornea with different scans and then do a map, a pachymetry map. The spachymetry maps are shown uh, here and also could do epithelial um, maps. And these epithelial maps will show uh, the, 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 the epithelium of the, and the stroma separate, not only on a whole map. This helps a lot when we try to see uh, static disorders of the cornea or if we want to see if we have keratoconus, for example, these pachymetry maps will be quite sensitive and they will show the zone where the protrusion is or the thinner cornea in this case of uh, keratoconus. Uh, this type of technologies not only show us different types of maps, 
these types of technologies uh, improving the uh, resolution will give us several uh, cuts around the cornea. You could do like uh, the first OCTs uh, let us uh, do like 12 or 16 different slides of the cornea. Now you could do hundreds of slides of the cornea and then do a 3D reconstruction map quite the same as they do with shine flow technology. So right now we could have also, if, as I told you, epithelial thickness showing different types of maps in keratoconus assessment using not only uh, OCT, but also combinations of other technologies. For example, in this machine, you could see OCT and also some are, uh, uh, topography rings, placido rings that are using it for getting the other maps of the machine. One of the technologies advantage since it's very sensitive and you could get a, a lot of, of, of elevation from this is getting OPD maps. In this case, we're talking just about corneal OPD maps. You could not measure the whole crystal lens and get a, a, a full OPD map or a full aberrometry map for, for the eye without the use of an aberrometer. In this case, we're looking at the elevation maps and with the elevation maps, we could do uh, the Cerniki uh, coefficients and see all the different types of high order aberrations and low order aberrations that are displayed in this cornea. When I was talking about the crystal lens, uh, some advantages in the technology could uh, let us measure the lens. You couldn't get the whole uh, visualization of the lens because most of CT technology is blocked by the pigment. And since we get a lot of pigment in the posterior sides of the iris, this could be blocked. I mean, the, the white lens could be blocked and then you could get the best imaging in the center where the pupil is and less good imaging on the periphery where you need to measure the crystalline lens. Nevertheless, some technologies let us uh, measure the whole lens thickness, like in this example, and also the lens uh, diameter. So here comes our second poll question. Which of this could be achieved using anterior segment OCT? Goniometrics, corneal elevation maps, corneal topography maps, crystalline lens metrics, or all of the above. So anterior segment OCT technology could give us all of the above information, goniometrics, corneal elevation maps, corneal topography maps, and crystalline lens metrics. Crystalline lens metrics, again, depends on the type of OCT you're using, depends on the penetration, that's because of the wavelength of the uh, OCT you're using, but it could get some lens metrics. Actually, uh, when you're working with swap source OCT, you get better lens metrics than with other machines. Uh, if you're talking about, for example, uh, biometers, and we're talking about the IL master, the IL master has a version that it's based on swap source and get really good measures of the crystalline lens, even the whole, the whole eye. So the technology evolves a lot and it could do 3D reconstructions of the interior segment. This is with swap source OCT. With swap source OCT, instead of doing like 10 or 12 or 16 different scans, you could do hundreds of scans and hundreds of, of scans could do a 3D reconstruction, complete interior segment and see different cuts in different uh, parts of the eye. This is again a 3D video where you could see the reconstruction of the interior part of the eye. You could see even the posterior part of the iris and you could do several cuts in different positions. So you could go through all this uh, 3D uh, model of the eye. Let's see some cases of what you could do with the anterior segment OCT. You could do evaluation of uh, B scans for the anterior segment. You could do three millimeter lines, six millimeter lines, 12 millimeter lines, and 16 millimeter lines. So you could get the whole cornea and even part of the, of, as you could see, eyelids and some, some of the anterior segment uh, accessories. Speed, speed is important. We talked that 
time the time the main OCT started doing like 200 uh, A scans per second, then 2,000 A scans per second, then a uh, spectral domain could do uh, 50,000 A scans per second, and now structures could do up to 100,000 A scans per second. So the faster the OCT, you you will get less uh, noise in the background, and you could get less uh, ghost images. So uh, it's it's better. Then we got densitometric evaluation. This is nice because uh, if if you're doing, for example, an interior segment uh, OCT of uh, the region, and you're suspecting that could be uh, neoplasia, then uh, the density change could tell you which type of pathology you are used, uh, you, you are seeing. It's kind of like using like a biopsy. That's why OCT is sometimes called like uh, in vivo or live biopsy. Also, you could see in, if you're doing anterior segment of CT of a glaucoma surgery, for example, a, a trabeculectomy, if the bleb is well formed, you could measure it, or you could see if the bleb is uh, cystic and it's not filtrating anymore the, the, the surgeries. And you could get images through opaque corneas. That's again due to the uh, wavelength that most anterior segment OCTs are working with. This type of resolution could let us even look at here. You could see where the arrows are. You could see the flap of LASIK surgery. When we start doing interior segment OCT of different patients, here is the flap edge. Okay. When we start doing the interior segment OCTs of LASIK patients, when uh, you perform LASIK surgery with microkeratom, these flaps are uh, not as regular as you will see with femtosecond assisted uh, laser. This is done with a femtosecond assisted laser. That's why you can see it's almost perfect. What else you could do? You could do evaluation of intrastromal rings since this anterior segment OCT could detect and give us elevation maps and, and several topography maps about a uh, keratoconus uh, screening. Then when you do the treatment afterwards and you place, for example, a segment of an intrastromal ring with this uh, technology, you could measure if the ring is in place and uh, how, how near you are to the corneal endothelium because one of the complications of the surgery is aspersion into the interior chamber of this of these rings. This again is an incision made with a femtosecond laser. You can see quite good with the Swepsor's OCT incisions made by the laser. Again, another uh, interest from a ring patient case. Now you got the hole into your chamber. You can see here with this OCT, you could see the whole crystalline lens pretty well. Here are the segments in position. And this is the image of the interior segment showing where we are doing the cut. This is a nice case that was uh, published online in the American Academy Journal uh, some time ago. And it shows another uh, indication for Swepsor's OCT. This is a uh, this capsular distension syndrome and an 83 year woman that was performed a uh, phaco surgery on the uh, right eye two years after follow-up, a uh, patient complained about the blur vision and then they could see that it was a distension of the posterior capsule. Here is the lens, you see the IOL, and here is a lot of, of material beneath. They performed the jack laser capsulotomy and it resolves completely. You can see the image here again. The posterior capsule is attached to the surface of the IOL. Uh, now, it, this shows how interior segment OCT uh, could uh, see density of different uh, types of, of solutions on particles in this case. And uh, the change in this uh, density will let, let us know what's going on. And it's actually give us like a map where we can perform safely any procedure that we want to do. Another interesting thing that you could do with a uh, anterior segment OCT uh, is measuring of the extraocular muscles. This is uh, a study that was performed uh, a couple of years ago and was uh, reported on the ophthalm ophthalmology strabismus uh, from the pediatric magazine. And it shows measurements of the extraocular muscles after, 
after surgery, after estrabismal surgery. And uh, they compared three types, oops, sorry. They compared uh, three different OCTs. Two of them were spectral domain and one of them was swap source OCT. So uh, the images of the swap source OCT are clearly, and they could measure uh, even a, uh, easier all the uh, extraocular muscles. Uh, so at the spectral domain OCT, we won't show that that good results, but you could get some uh, uh, good reproducibility between these methods. So when you're doing a strabismal surgery, usually they use calipers to measure this. Uh, this is a more reliable measurement uh, technology that you could use. Of course, it's cheaper to use a caliper. And sometimes when you're doing estrobismal surgery, you don't have all the resources, but if you could have uh, some access to this technology, this will give us uh, really good measurements and a more reproducibility on, in this case. There are a lot of papers being published about anterior segment OCT. Some of them, as I told you, measuring uh, metrics of the anterior segment, some measuring extraocular muscles, some change in difference in the anterior chamber uh, between gonioscopy and, and others uh, uh, anterior segment OCTs. Some taking tomographic uh, of, the, of the anterior segment and also looking at glaucoma lab morphology as we were talking about. Now it's time for us to our third poll question. Which are the major advantage of anterior segment OCT? Images through opaque structures, speed, multiple maps for anterior segment evaluation, high resolution compared to other anterior segment image technologies, or all of the above. So anterior segment OCT, we been talking about, it could be used for a lot of different interior segment metrics and assessments. So we want to know which are the major advantages of interior segment OCT. We have the answers coming through. All of the above, that's correct again. Uh, image through opaque structures is really important. If you're doing metrics of the, of the angle recess, we talk about it. Speed is really important. If you want to do uh, good images and 3D reconstructions, multiple maps, that's true. Pachymetry maps, endothelial maps, topographic maps, elevation maps, all different types of maps right now with the software in interior segment OTT and high resolution compared to other anterior segment imaging technologies. Of course, that's true when you want to see the anterior part of the eye. Let's see a case. This is a patient that I found when I was doing a training session in Colombia and we saw a biker that was uh, driving without using a helmet. And then a bee came flying through and it sticks right, he, he felt it, it hits and sticks into his eye. So after some time, the, the vision of the eye started diminishing. He complained of a lot of pain and decides to go to the clinic. When we, when we see it at the clinic, there was a, uh, a lot of edema in that zone. He told us that it was a bee that hit him and he uh, removed it from the eye. And the bee sting is, was actually, we suppose it was behind all this uh, because we couldn't see the interior segment quite well. I mean, it was a huge edema in the area. So we decided to do a anterior segment OCT and you could see the edema was clearly because the cornea is really, really, really thick. And here you could see part of the sting in the anterior chamber. I have a video so you could see it better. You see here's the normal cornea, then it starts going thicker. Here is the sting coming through and after it, you see a whole thickening in the cornea. This uh, bee sting with the uh, with the toxins that it came with gave a lot of reaction. Here is the bee sting. You see, it's almost anterior stroma because the guy has taken the bee out of the eye. So it it, it was a lot of, of of edema and a lot of toxic reaction here. Uh, he needs to go into the OR. The anterior segment surgeons found it and could get it out, but. 
there's this is a real interesting case I like to show. Another thing that you could do is talking about now glaucoma, evaluation of the different implants that you could do on glaucoma. We were talking about the blep morphology. You could see if the density here starts showing uh, changes due to fibrin reaction, or if there are different fists being formed, you could see the incision where, where it's going into an ear chamber. And when you do all the different uh, OCT uh, cuts, you could see like a tunnel where it's, it's, it's really uh, doing its work. If we're talking about uh, the, the implants, you could see the, the lumen of the valve, uh, if it's really good or if it's not filtrating quite well. This is another nice case of a friend of mine, Dr. Carl Gledenberg from Austria. It's a 68 year old patient that using chronically for sleep apnea oxygen. So the mask he was using uh, doesn't cover quite well his nose. It wasn't attached quite well. So there was a filtration of the O2 through the mask all the night. And the patients start complaining about some uh, blur vision and uh, irritation on his eye and a lot of discomfort and a lot of epiphora. So uh, when we saw the eye, the eye was clearly, clearly, totally inflammated. And uh, when we do anterior segment OCT, you could see here is the tear film. You could measure the tear film meniscus with the tear segment of the T. And when we go through the cornea, what we could see are different ulcers in the cornea due to the air filtration that was going directly all the time, all the night. Uh, the patient's cousin got a good occlusion of the eyelids, as you can see here in the image. So uh, it, it was a, a, a really uh, chronic ulcer because of this. Uh, he changed the mask, we give them treatment, and uh, the patient comes out really, really good. You could do also metrics for uh, measuring uh, contact lens. And this comes really handy when you are adapting scleral contact lenses. Scleral contact lenses are not like regular lenses. They fit and sit on the sclera, and you need to measure the distance from the limbus to the sclera, like here, to see if it's uh, sitting clearly, if it's fitting correctly. And also it's important to see the um, space between the cornea, the lacrimal film and the contact lens, like in the center vision, and also measuring in other different positions. So adaptation of scleral contact lenses, it's, uh, Another thing that our uh, anterior segment OCT help us with. Here you can see different measurements of the anterior contact lens. You can do also evaluation of the iris root. The iris root and the vertex, again, it's better uh, vis visualized when you use a swap source OCT. If you're using a time domain OCT or a spectral domain OCT, then you couldn't evaluate the uh, iris root. This is uh, another of the advantage of the, of the uh, technology. In this case, this is a case report measuring PAS in glaucoma. Uh, and in the evaluation of the iris, you could see also the evaluation of the posterior part of the iris. This is not like usually OCT scans, but I'm showing this to uh, talk about the uh, improve of the technology. Usually one of the limitations when we were talking about OCT and I started lecture talking about it is uh, OCT is blocked by the pigment and you got a lot of pigment in the iris. It's the, it's the same uh, type of disadvantage that you get uh, when you're trying to get beneath the pigmented epithelium, uh, the RPE on the, on the retina. If you see the pigment below the RPE, the choroid is really difficult to scan. So if you want to evaluate the posterior part of the iris, or if you want to evaluate the choroid, it's better OCTs with deeper penetration. That could give you a, a more feasible view of these structures. 
You could evaluate on the iris, not only the iris root, you could evaluate nodules of the iris. This is some micro photography showing a lot of iris nodules. And you could look at the iris sets. Also, you could see the change of the density in different parts, differentiating what is a more homogeneous density inside the cyst and more heterogenic on the other ones. Now, the evaluation of the ciliary body. Evaluation of the ciliary body is uh, usually you use uh, UBM for these types of evaluation because uh, OCT couldn't see uh, the ciliary body quite well. But this was the first time they used in this uh, paper report on uh, 2018. OCT swept or OCT to see the uh, ciliary body and uh, the change of the ciliary body during accommodation. The visualization and evaluation of uh, ciliary body with OCT, it's only possible, again, if you use long wavelength swept source OCT. Here you could see quite well the ciliary body, swept source OCT, the same patient with the spectral domain OCT, you couldn't see quite well. This is because again, the wavelength, uh, deeper wavelength will give us a lot of different, uh, a lot of penetration in tissue. If you're using tan domain OCT that usually has a, a deeper wavelength, you could get through tissue, but the scan rate is so slow and the, and the eye could move with microsaccadic movement then you couldn't get a great image. You will get a blur image, most like the same that you get on a spectral domain. So again, for going through opaque media, it's better a uh, bigger wavelength technology. It's time for a last poll question today. Which structures are not visible with anterior segment OCT? Posterior iris, ciliary body, Corneal endothelium, extraocular muscles, corneoscleral junction. I'll give it time for you to answer. Which structures are not visible with anterior segment OCT? Posterior iris, ciliary body, corneal endothelium, extraocular muscles, corneoscleral junction. Here we have uh, some disagreement. Posterior iris, you could see posterior iris with anterior segment OCT if you're using uh, the correct technology as well as the ciliary body, that's true. Extraocular muscles, you could see extraocular muscles. We've seen a couple of articles talking about this. Corneoscleral junction, of course, you could see the corneoscleral junction. What you could not see with the anterior segment OCT is the corneal endothelium. The corneal endothelium is a single layer of cells and we don't have right now the, the capacity of do a correct segmentation of the endothelium. You could do an automatic segmentation of the epithelium. You could get an automatic measurements of the angles, goniometry, but you could not see right now a single layers of cells of the corneal endothelium. Remember this, these are uh, really small structures. You need a, 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 a specular microscopy or, or another type of technology for seeing this small single line cell. Now, what else is coming? What else could you do? What else is new on anterior segment OCT? This is a nice paper that su suggests uh, correlation between uh, breakup time and also the height of the uh, meniscus, the lacrimal film meniscus. So uh, getting different measurements of the height of the meniscus uh, could give us a lot of information about dry eye disease in some patients. So this is evolving and now by measuring uh, small area, right now you could do only small area of the central cornea. Hopefully this technology could uh, evolve a little bit more and you could get a big issue. You could see the dynamics of the uh, lacrimal film. So this is uh, like the breakup time again, but uh, instead of using the slit lamp, you could have 
uh, over time, how uh, the dynamic of the lacrimal film is, is it changing, how it starts on the, on the second one and it starts diminishing, going down on the second ten. This is normal, but you could see a lot of changes in the first five seconds on patients that have uh, dry eye disease. Another new thing that is coming to anterior segment OCT is OCTA, OCT angiography. OCT angiography right now is on uh, the beginning of the study stages. You could do images of the anterior segment base, vessels. You don't have the reproducibility as, as, as we would like to right now. The technology is constantly evolving and I'm sure that we will get uh, a lot of, of better images and reproducibility of this on the upcoming years. Right now, we don't have metrics. We couldn't measure the flow. We could see uh, zones that uh, are not only on the iris, but we could see a corneal neovascularization. And uh, this is a nice feature to, to see coming coming through on the on the next years. With reconstruction and AMFAS images, you could see also uh, 3D reconstructions of, of uh, pupillary plaque or pupillary membrane, like, like in this case. This is a nice paper also that uh, shows conjunctival and intrascleral vasculatures using anterior segment OCT and geography. These are normalized. Uh, as in regular OCTA, we are doing uh, scans on uh, different depths of the eye. This is superficial plexus, zero to 100 microns. Intermediate plexus, this is uh, 100 to 200 microns. These two accounts, the superficial layer, and then the deep layers, 200 to 300 and 300 to 1000 microns. Here you could see different layers, all of them. This is 1000 microns depth. This is the whole square depth. And you will see different uh, reds and blues showing like a Doppler sign uh, or a flow. It's actually it's not Doppler. It's a flow measurement uh, based on the, on the same principle of OCTA that it's uh, the uh, blood flow going through these vessels. I'm start uh, answering some of your questions. Can anterior segment OCT be used to understand the integrity of the posterior capsule of the lens in opaque corneas? Yes, uh, anterior segment OCT can be used to understand the integrity uh, of the posterior capsule. You could, uh, if there is a something in between the IOL and the posterior capsule. If you have some sort of uh, interface between the posterior capsule and the IOL, you could see the, the, the integrity of the posterior capsule. You couldn't go through the, 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 the periphery, though. You couldn't go only uh, through the... If you dilate the patient, you get a bigger pupil, you get a bigger view, but you couldn't get the, the borders or the really ends of the, of the posterior capsule. So uh, it will depend, actually. Can PPC can be the diagnosed on OCT? If you're talking about interior segment OCT, posterior uh, capsule opacification, you could see, you could diagnose that, sure. Uh, thank you so much, excellent presentation. Maybe uh, it's possible also, uh, not with uh, anterior segment OCT. Usually, mebomian gland, uh, when you want to see that, you need to use another type of light. You could uh, have a slit lamps uh, with interior uh, cameras that could do uh, visualization of meibomian glands. We couldn't do that right now with interior segment OCT. Thank you, nice presentation, very informative. Does the machine operation need a special training? Uh, yes, depending on which one you're using. Some of them are more uh, user-friendly some of them are not that much user friendly. It's like uh, using posterior segment OCT. You do need some training. I don't think it's, it's, it's that hard, uh, the learning curve. Uh, I, I do think you, you need some, um, 
instructions prior to, to using it. Is confocal biomicroscopy the best modality to assess corneal endothelial integrity? Yes. Yes, uh, for the endothelium, that is the best imaging technology we have right now. Not only for the endothelium, you could see with the confocal uh, microscopy the, uh, uh, and, and intrastromal nerves, you could see the whole stroma. You could see uh, uh, carito, uh, the cells of the cornea when they are activated. You could see a lot of different uh, cellular uh, changes at the cellular level using a confocal biomicroscopy. So that's, that's really, if you want to see the endothelium, the, 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 the best technology right now. Although you could do that also with uh, regular uh, specular microscopies, they will show you a lot of uh, resolution of the endothelial cells, if you just want to look at the endothelium. Can we say, can we say which layer of tear film is deficient on an OCT? No. You couldn't say which layer of the tear film is deficient on OCT. You uh, do need another type of studies for that. Can anterior segment OCT replace gonioscopy? Well, that's an interesting question. Usually on gonioscopy, you see uh, you get a direct visualization of what you're of what you're seeing. Uh, anterior segment OCT with goniometrics information won't show you. Uh, the direct visualization of the structures that you use for goniometry, uh, for go gonioscopy, I'm sorry. So uh, goniometric measurements are reproducibility, got a good reproducibility. You could uh, rely on them most of the time, but I don't think any uh, technology right now will, uh, will, will change the way that we do clinic. I do think these are imaging diagnostics that will help us assess in difficult and difficult situation. For example, patients with a with a cornea an opaque cornea or with tinea or things that couldn't show us a, a direct visualization. If you want to have metrics, you need a good weight or good tools to to, to measure intersegments. So. Uh, I don't think it will it will uh, replace goniometry any or gonioscopy anytime soon. Can I see the angle that it's supposed to set of inclination of the the bolt the bolt you could see the bolt with this yes yes you could. Are goniometrics affected by skill pressure measurement them or is objected down by the machine? There are depending again on the OCT you're using, some of them do automatic metrics, some of them uh, have manual metrics. It is effective on the, on the person doing the metrics and it's effective on the light source of the uh, place you're doing the metrics. Uh, it's uh, not the same uh, having a light bulb on or, or off during this because of the iris. Uh, movement and the changing on the tear segment. Uh, can an anterior segment OCT be done for punta also? Yes, you could do any type of, of uh, implant or anterior segment implant. You could look anything that go into the eye, that go into the, 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 the eyelid or any type of implant. The technology could give us this. All the, drawing, the drawings we're taking from the Cassia 1000? No. The, some of them were from the Cassia 1000. Some of them were from the Cassia 2. Most of them were from the Triton. Triton is a swept source OCT also, 10, 50 nanometers. And it gives a good penetration in the interior chamber and also in the posterior segment. Some of them too, the 3D reconstructions and the 3D movies, they were from the cast. What are the disease best diagnosed by anterior segment OCT? Diagnosed? Well, you could diagnose a corneal ectasia, keratoconus, or ectasia post uh, LASIK surgery. Uh, you could diagnose uh, the anterior chamber recess of the angle. I don't want to see uh, acute glaucoma because you don't need anterior chamber OCT with acute glaucoma, but you could see if the angle is prone to be closed 
So that's another thing that you, you could diagnose with interior chamber, I mean, with interior segment OCT. You could see the density of the crystalline lens sometimes, or you could diagnose uh, cataracts, uh, uveitis, certainly, with re anterior chamber reaction. So there's a lot of different uh, pathologies that you could diagnose with anterior segment OCT. Corneal epithelial thickness and keratoconus early detection. Of course, corneal epithelial thickness, you could do keratoconus early detections, almost the same as uh, shine flock imaging technology. Perfect, thank you guys. Uh, again, sorry for the for the, uh, the signal drop at the end and uh, I hope we see you soon. Bye-bye.